Happy collecting, everybody, and uh, welcome back to Stars of the Diamonds. My name is Rhett, and today we're going to be doing another vintage card set feature, but this one's going to be a little bit different in that um, I've had a lot of requests to uh, cover another Zenut set, but uh, I thought it would be apt, and I've had some requests also to cover the differences in the different years of these cards. So these cards were produced uh, starting in 1911 and went all the way to 1938. And uh, each year they would change slightly, usually the, uh, the layout of the cards. And uh, so I have kind of uh, some representatives of all the different sets today. And we're just gonna kind of go through each year and kind of describing exactly what makes a card from 1911 versus, you know, say 1925 or even 1938. So uh, to start it off, the first year of Z-Nut cards, and these were made by the Collins McCarthy Candy Company, uh, were from 1911, and uh, I have a whole featured video that features this set, so I don't want to cover it too much. But they have these really great um, sepia images, uh, studio shots, and um, so you can kind of see what those look like. And they're a little bit bigger than a standard size um, trading card. And, you know, the following year, they kind of went with kind of the same color, but uh, definitely changed it up a little bit and featured these cards on, almost looks like a little bit of like a candy bar or a chocolate bar or something like that. But they just have this uh, flat brown color and they really changed more to sort of an action shot. And I really love this one with the sweater. And, you know, this is one of my favorite cards uh, of all time, just, uh, Ivan Howard uh, sitting there on the probably on the on deck circle, waiting to to get into the game, and uh, just a really great set. But in 1912, so here's 11, here's 1912, 1912, uh, a certain product that they made called Home Run Kisses also made their own set, and uh, they look distinctly different from the regular 1912 set. Uh, this would be the only year that they would produce uh, multiple. Uh, sets featuring uh, the Pacific Coast League players. Okay, so those are all 1912. These are 1912 home run kisses, also produced by the same makers of Zenit cards. 1913, um, they would move on to a slightly different style. And I'm going to grab a couple of these here just so that we can kind of talk with them without me having to reach over the whole time. So in 1913, they went with a slightly smaller card. The reality is, is it wasn't all that much smaller. Okay, so they were a little bit smaller, but these actually originally had a little coupon attached to the bottom that 99.9% .9 of the time nowadays are missing. And I have, uh, I don't have a 1913 example right here, but I have a 1916 example that still has that coupon attached. So you can kind of see what this would have looked like with that coupon still attached. So in 1913, they kind of went with these um, yellow, kind of a sepia tone as well. And, uh, you know, really good action shots, some some strange, strange photography in the 1913 set. I really like this one of, uh, of Becker getting ready to hit the ball. And, you know, so we got some examples there of 1913. 1914, they kind of went with a slate gray color. And they can come either, you know, kind of a dark charcoal or more of a slate over here. And not no real difference in price or cost or anything like that between the two of them. They just, uh, same card can be found in different ways, darker or lighter. And then in uh, the following season in 1915, and every single card from the 1913 set all the way to 1937 had that coupon attached. So you can, if you're lucky, find those still attached to the cards. So in 1915, they kind of went with a, you know, cut a, cut away the background and went with a sort of a sepia highlight. And you can kind of see it's a, it's a black and white image, but they were able to add sort of sepia Im, uh, highlights to the image. And uh, so you can kind of see two cards there and uh, kind of cool in that this set is uh, has some variations of the where, of where they applied the sepia. So you can kind of see in this player, Howlin' in for Salt Lake, you can see his hands that are holding onto the bat, 
can either be found with or without that sepia highlight. So um, for the crazy person that wants to collect this set with all variations, good luck. Um, the 1915 set is a notoriously difficult set to find, uh, more difficult than the 1911, 12, 13, or 14 years. And uh, so following the 1915 set with this sort of black and white image with the sepia highlights, we get to the 1916 set. And the 1916s were a distinct dis uh, departure from what they've done before. Here was that card that we showed before with the coupon still attached, so we'll put the 15s down. So 1916 kind of has a, a black and white image, but they have almost a simulated uh, sky in the background with clouds. And so you can kind of really see sort of that simulated blue sky. Kind of a pretty set. Uh, they don't necessarily look so great when they're in poor, poor condition. There's Ping Bodhi. Uh, but good, uh, good set to find. This set is famous for featuring the, uh, the Jimmy Claxton card, which was the first... Uh, you know, widely produced card featuring an African American in the uh, in the 20th century, and he had lied about his uh, ethnic background in order to play for the Oakland Oaks in the 1916 season for the Pacific Coast League. They made a card of him, found out that he was in fact actually African American, due to the you know the color barrier that was in place he was then barred from playing further, but that card has become sort of a legendary rarity in the baseball card world. So those are the 1916s. Um, in 1917, they kind of switched to a somewhat muted and, and kind of a boring set, to be honest with you. So in 1917, they went to just a straight, almost like sepia type black and white image of um, the cards and on this side we actually have Jacinto Calvo which was an early Cuban uh, you know player within the Pacific Coast League and uh, his card for that reason is is pretty highly prized uh, just love the sweaters gotta love those 1918 is a really rare set and it ha it's one of the most distinctive looking of all the Zenut sets because of this really red border now, the 1918 set, for a couple different reasons, is a lot harder to find than some of the other years. Uh, notably, in 1918, there was, you know, we were in World War I, and also, in addition, I guess, uh, appropriately, we would be talking about this this year, in 2020, because 1918 is the year of the Spanish flu. And uh, so, interestingly, sh uh, this guy for Salt Lake here, is featured, I believe, in the T206 set, and he actually would pass away in 1918 of the Spanish flu. So he died of the Spanish flu in the year that this card was made. So uh, kind of a kind of a morbid card, I, I suppose. But uh, the 1918 set is very rare. The Pacific Coast League season was cut short that year uh, due to the various uh, uh, the Spanish flu epidemic, along with uh, World War II. So uh, rare, rare set, uh, really hard to complete. Uh, one of the smaller sets, I think there's only 104 cards in that set, has a really, the first card ever of Lefty O'Doul is, uh, is in there, who should be in the Hall of Fame, if not for his playing for, you know, his uh, introducing and popularizing baseball in Japan. So his first ever card is, is in this set. And uh, he was largely a pitcher at that point and would later become uh, a great, great hitter during the, you know, hitter-friendly 1930s. So 1918s look like that. 1919 is a set that um, is, is pretty popular in, a, in that it's completable, okay? And a uh, cool set, and here not in super high grade or anything, is uh, the first uh, mainstream card of Dazzy Vance, the future Hall of Fame pitcher and uh, a couple creases on that one but uh just kind of show you this one some of these cards sometimes can be found without the sepia uh, highlight of the player on sort of a slate gray background so this one is sort of with the sepia and without it same guy and uh here is the first ever card of perhaps the greatest player in pacific coast league history uh russell buzz arlett and uh, that's always 
amongst the people that collect Pacific Coast League uh, players. And uh, Zenit cards, a highly prized card for, for that reason. But uh, I kind of wanted to show a couple other cards. This one um, doesn't look like too, too much at first, but this actually features NFL Hall of Famer, and uh, future at this point, NFL Hall of Famer, uh, Babe Driscoll. And, you know, famous, famous football player, not so much known for his baseball, but he did play professional baseball as well. And uh, so this card is... For, from football collectors has become a, a pretty highly priced card. Now there are a couple cards in this 1919 set um, that feature some variations and if you kind of look at uh, this McCready card you can kind of see uh, between his his arm and his body we got a little bit of a highlight uh, whited out area and he can be found sort of with or without that area colored in. Um, my one of my favorite cards of all time is in this 1919 set, and it features uh, the Hol uh, Hollywood actor uh, Fatty Arbuckle, who is part owner of the Vernon Tigers, and he had his own card. And I have that card, and I, I'll probably feature it in another video at some point. But I uh, just wanted to kind of run through those. So that's the 1919 set. In 1920, they would move on from that. And this is one of the ones that's pretty popular with collectors because in 1920, they put a simulated grandstand in the background and uh, just a really cool set of cards with uh, the, you know, the mock stadium in the background with the pennants and, you know, the first the, the fans. But a, a fun set of cards, always one of the more popular of the, the Xenot series. And uh, in this set, a couple guys, this guy, Bromley, was featured on two separate cards. I haven't really done much research, but I, I imagine one of the cards may not actually feature Jack Bromley, and it could be somebody else. But uh, that's a pretty crazy looking catcher card uh, for Adams for Seattle. I think that's Jack Adams. 1921, pretty boring set. Again, similar to like 1917 in its style. Um, just has really, oh, and before I get into that, so here's a 1920 card of uh, former Major League player Sam Crawford who was at the twilight of his career and was playing for Los Angeles uh, foreseeably enjoying the much nicer climate of Los Angeles versus uh, Detroit and uh, so that's a that's a fun card even with uh, condition obvious condition flaws so sorry moving back to 1921 uh, Again, similar to 1917 in that it's simply a cutaway background with a slightly sepia image of the player. Uh, one of my favorite guys in baseball history is Gabby Kravath, uh, early home run king and, and everything. Uh, this is his last card uh, featured before he would uh, go on to retirement. But fun set, this is Doc Crandall. He's featured in the T206 set with the Giants. And uh, put those down. 1922 actually harkens back to the 1915 set. So if you kind of pull one of those out, it was the you know sepia highlights on a black and white player. And in 1922, you can kind of see they went back to that same style with the black and white image with the sepia highlights. So these are what 1922s look like. And uh, like the 1920, 1915s, uh, these cards can be found with variations. And uh, so there's a Paul Strand, he's Pacific Coast League Hall of Fame. But as you can kind of see here, this particular player uh, either comes with or without his head being in the sepia highlight. And this one here, the bat can be found, and a little bit of his arm there can be found with or without that sepia highlight. Now I'm gonna hold this guy back because one of the most, one of the rarest of all the Zenut sets, it always usually gets lumped in together with the 1923 set, which is kind of a boring set. It looks like just a black and white card. But um, the, the theory is, is that the 1923 set was not ready for the start of the season. So they reprinted 24 cards of the Oakland Oaks and the San Francisco Seals, which is where the Collins uh, McCarthy Candy Company was, uh, it was located. 
and they uh, foreseeably had those ready at the very beginning of the 1923 season and they just remade some of the 1922 cards but redated them so uh, in that you can kind of see that's what this is right here so you can see it looks just like a 1922 has the sepia highlights and has actually the exact same picture as uh, for in this example Sam Agnew's 1922 card but um, it the date has been changed to 1923 so I've always contended that this should be its own set okay 24 cards and that's it um, half and half seals and oaks and you know distinctly different than the rest of the 1923 cards and uh, I keep these ones out because we saw the the variation and the CP on those two he was among the players that was remade in 1923 and you can kind of see uh, the date change the, the the size of the name the date change 1922 versus 1923 and uh, you can really see that now these 1923 sepias are really really difficult cards to find and uh, I would love to pick up one of those with a coupon still attached because that's one of the uh, one of the last ones I need to get that uh, the coupon run but uh, I have not seen one of those available for sale for for quite a while so if you have one of those let me know but uh, those are 1923 and uh, again I'm gonna kinda show you what the regular 1923s look like so you can kinda see the difference so here's a coupon one. This is kind of a super-sized coupon one. Must have been on the end of the sheet or something. And you can see distinctly different size, style, everything between the sepia 1923 set versus the regular 1923s. One of my favorite cards of all time is Moses Yellow Horse here. Um, Native American heritage, you know, with him. Just a, an interesting character. Uh, fun one to research if you have some time. But, uh, you know, fun fun cards here. So those are uh, kind of the last of the, what I always cons consider sort of the Generation 1 Xenut cards. Because in 1924, they would go to a distinctly different style. And uh, for a lot of people, it becomes a lot less interesting. Um, I still enjoy them very, very much. But they definitely do have a little bit of a different feel to the cards after that. So we're going to grab this stack back here. So in 1924, they went away from sort of the cut away background and went to a action shot in the stadium. And uh, for most of these cards, it's easy to tell which year they are. They typically will have the date right on front. So eventually they'll change it from the full year 1924 like this to you know, kind of just putting just the year. So in this case, this is a 1929. So it'll just say 29 on the top. Okay, so 1924, you know, uh, has these kind of interesting, you know, cool, cool images. I, I love the stadium backgrounds, but distinctly less interesting in style, I suppose, less pretty cards. But uh, in nice condition, which they're often usually not found in, they they are very nice looking cards. And uh, Leon Cador, there's Doc Crandall again, and uh, so 1925. Again, very similar to kind of what we've seen in before, but they do say 1925 distinctly right on front. And there's a Buzz Arlet, uh, Ed Brandt. He was featured in like the 1933 Gaudi set. And uh, probably one of the, the more popular 1925 cards is this early card of possible future Hall of Famer. I don't know if he ever gets in, but uh, Babe Herman and for Seattle. So really, really tough card. Seattle's Enoch cards highly highly collected by by people you know largely from the pacific uh northwest that enjoy their their seattle sports moving on to 1926 here's a 26 with the uh with the coupon still attached a little bit of a dirty one and uh that's louis guisto uh, brick eldred and this is kind of an interesting guy his uh it's uh, ike danning and uh, early early player of Jewish heritage and uh, so tends to bring a pretty print, uh, penny when that one actually comes up for sale so those are 1926 and the next year is kind of an interesting one it's kind of funny they really uh, changed up the the display on the cards so in 1927 
you can kind of see there's a couple different uh, styles here. So these are all 1927s. So on these three, you can kind of see they largely look just like the 1926s and the 25s beforehand, but they just changed it to a 27. And uh, here's two, you know, with the coupon still attached. But they also made half of the set, instead of having that date like that, they put this strange little box on the front of the card up here that just had the date 27 there. And so on those ones, they're set the same set, same, you know, same sheets and everything like that. Half the cards are found like this and half of them are found like that. So uh, the same players always found in the same way. So kind of an interesting year. 1927 is probably one of the more easy sets to complete. There's no impossible rarities. Most years of Zenit cards have one or two guys that are at the minimum just almost impossible to find. Varying degrees of rarity throughout the series. So uh, very rarely is there a set that's just straightforward like uh, say the Gaudi set or something like that where most guys other than say like the Lajoie and 1933 Gaudi um, were printed in the same, roughly the same quantity. So that's not the case with Zenit cards. They were adding, eliminating people throughout the season. So you get a lot of variation in um, rarities. And that, that's what makes it fun for me, can be annoying for others. And uh, here's another 1927 card of a former Big League Hall of Famer. And uh, this is Harry Hooper. And uh, he was, again, at the twilight of his career and uh, was with the Mission Bells, and that's why he's got a big bell on his chest. And uh, kind of a kind of a cool card. Yeah, actually, a pretty nice for the series. Moving on to 1928, again, very similar to the seasons before. And uh, so here's actually an Earl Averill. The last year, Earl Averill, uh, Hall of Famer Earl Averill, was in the Pacific Coast League before being purchased by the Cleveland Indians and uh, starting his Major League Hall of Fame career. Here's a 1928 with the, uh, with the coupon still attached. And you can see the coupon would expire in April of the following season. And uh, so there we go. This one's kind of interesting. This guy's last name is Burkett. His name is Howard. And this is actually Jesse Burkett, the Hall of Famer. This is his son. And uh, interesting, interesting story to look up. I don't know that they have the best relationship, but uh, moving on. 1929, we've got very similar set of cards. You know, looks much like the, the 1928s and the 27s before them. Here's a Smead Jolly. And so that's what 1929s look like. So 1930s, they kind of change things up. Similar to 1927, how some cards could be found in two different ways. This series, you could you can kind of see... So here's uh, three 1930 cards with sort of a large, just gigantic name style on the front. And um, Luis Almada was uh, uh, Melo Almada's brother and uh, was an early uh, Mexican-American player. And uh, But also 1930s can be found with the small names similar to, say, more like the style of the 1929s and the earlier sets. So... Kind of an interesting juxtaposition between those two. 31s, they changed it a lot. They took the, na the date away. And uh, now we just have Coast League, as you can kind of see here. So these are 1931s. If they don't have a date on the front like these, that's the year that they're from. And uh, we got Mike Gazella here, uh, famous for being one of the lesser known members of the 1927 Yankees team. And uh, his only cards, I believe, are in the Zenut series, as are Julian Vera and a bunch of other people. So for whatever reason, in 1932, they went back to kind of making a set that had the cutaway borders. And it tends to be one of the more popular sets with collectors because it's just so different than the 1931s before it and the 1933s after it. So it kind of harkens back to, um, say, like the 19... 23 set in its style but uh, the 1932s uh, you can see here's Dolph Camilli um, and uh, that's what those look like and kind of an interesting one they say Coast League the player's name and the team there's one player and every example of this guy is known this way they totally messed up and instead of saying Coast League on the front they just wrote Coast Coast so 
uh, you know, probably just a, an error in, you know, on the printer's part, but every other card in that set other than Brandon says Coast League, but Brandon apparently played for the Coast Coast. And uh, so that's 1932s. 1933, um, they kind of made two distinct uh, series, and uh, they made these set. It's a, it's a small set of 48 cards, I believe, and uh, they're in the sepia color. Okay, so they're all from 1933, and they have this little box, and that would be sort of the way that they would make the cards from this point on with the box and the name, the team name, Coast League in it and everything. But in 1933, some cards can be found with this sepia color. Um, also in 1933, they began making these same cards, and you can kind of see they look very, very similar in non-sepia. Okay, and this non-sepia would be what they would continue to the end of the print run. So 30, if they're sepia like this, 1933. If they are not, um, it becomes pretty difficult to date them. And it's uh, kind of a headache, to be honest with you. So all of these cards here are from what is largely considered the 1933 to 1936 Zenut set. Problem is, is that the only way to date these cards is if they still have the coupons attached because they are dated, again, from the season before when they expire. So this Ox Eckert is from 1935, whereas this Tony Borja back here is from 1934. But once that coupon is attached, which is largely how you find them now, no way to tell. So there are people that are kind of, uh, you know, taking note of every card that's found with it with the coupon and what date they're from and everything but for the most part they're they're hard enough to find that it's that becomes almost an impossibility that being said this is probably the most common set to find cards still with the coupon attached so these cards um, can be found oftentimes when they would you know through the years they would change the size of the actual player on the image. So likely those are two, these Anton cards were printed in two different seasons. One was big, one was small, that kind of thing. There was uh, noted team changes. Okay, here's a, a Duster, the great Duster, uh, Walter Males. Here's three different pose ver uh, sizes, variations of him. And uh, this guy's kind of import, uh, interesting in that he became a Hollywood producer after his uh, baseball career was over, and his son became an even more famous, you know, TV and Hollywood producer. And uh, look up Frankovich, but it, that's an interesting guy. And uh, as you can kind of see here, here are three, same guy, three different teams, three different years. So he played for L.A., uh, San Francisco, and uh, for the Mission Reds, I believe, at this point. So, which was part of the San Francisco area. So, you know, kind of an interesting set. So, and also in 1933, obviously, that's the set that has the Joe DiMaggio uh, rookie first card in it, but it can also feature his uh, older brother. And uh, we have here Vince DiMaggio and the 1933 36 set. Now, that brings us to the next set which really looks very similar to this, but instead of having sort of the rounded corners to the black box, you have distinctly square corners to that black box. And that makes this a 1937 or 1938 card. And obviously this is Joe's other brother and uh, you know, arguably should be in the Hall of Fame, uh, Dom DiMaggio. So DiMaggio brothers here, Cool, it could make a cool display if you had the Joe DiMaggio card as well, flanked by his two brothers. But uh, the 1937 cards, and uh, you can see, you know, 1937 38s here again with those square tips to the, the box. And uh, so this one, instead of expiring in April 1st of 1938, it expired at the end of the season in 1937. So distinctly different. 1938s look exactly like these, but they were printed with no coupon on the base. So they were printed in this size, but they came with a separate coupon as an insert into the pack. 
and uh, very, very rare. Most likely the company was kind of going out of business and, uh, you know, just kind of halted production at that point. But anyways, that's kind of the rundown of the different years of Zenut cards. And uh, pretty, once you know what you're looking for, you can kind of, uh, within a glance, know what set you're, you're looking at, okay? And uh, anyways, thanks for tuning in to Stars the Diamond. Uh, be sure to hit that subscribe button and, uh, and like my videos. And if there's a set that you would like me to feature, let me know. Um, also, I'm going to be kind of doing something a little different this time. I have a card here, uh, a 19, what is this, 1929 Johnny Bassler, who played many years in the major leagues, and uh, I will be giving this card away to so to somebody who uh, comments below. Now, if you want to, to win this card, all you have to do is comment below and which is your favorite Zenut set. And, you know, in the comments below and, you know, let me know and why you like that set. And I will 100% arbitrarily choose the best answer that I like the most. And that person will be sent this card free of charge. All you have to do is just, you know, if you're, if I choose you, um, send me your address and I can get this card out to you. But uh, no questions asked, just a free card for somebody that might want it. So let me know in the comments below. Be sure to subscribe. And uh, thanks for coming to Stars of the Diamond. And be sure to hit that subscribe button. Happy collecting, everybody.